journalists always seem to know more than they write. Today, we will test that proposition. With us, Fred Barnes and Steve Hayes. Uncommon knowledge, now. Welcome to Uncommon Knowledge. I'm Peter Robinson. Fred Barnes is the executive editor and a co-founder of the Weekly Standard magazine and a regular contributor to Fox News. He served two years in the United States Army and received his undergraduate degree from the University of Virginia. Stephen Hayes is a senior writer for the Weekly Standard and a panelist on the Fox News program Special Report with Brett Baer. He holds an undergraduate degree from DePaul University and a graduate degree from the Columbia School of Journalism. Fred and Steve, welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having us. We are in the middle of the campaign. Question number one is not how the candidates are doing their job. It's the question how the media is doing its job. Jim Rutenberg, author of the Mediator column in the New York Times, quote, if you're a working journalist, this is in the New York Times, if you're a working journalist and you believe that Donald J. Trump is a demagogue, playing to the nation's worst racist and nationalistic tendencies, that he cozies up to anti-American dictators, and that he would be dangerous with control of United States nuclear codes, then you have to throw out the textbook of American journalism. Close quote. It is the right and moral thing to do to take objectivity and toss it over the side because Trump is Trump. On a scale of one to 10, let's say 10 is worthy of a Pulitzer and one is beneath supermarket tabloids, rate, rate the performance in this campaign of the mainstream media. Fred? Well, it's been completely one-sided. It's told half the story. It's, it's uh, the Washington Post, which I get every day. You know, we'll have four or five anti-Trump stories. Practically nothing on Hillary. You know, as if Hillary is, uh, is uh, uh, Mother Teresa or something running. It's all anti-Trump. It's really, and, and they forget entirely about uh, about Hillary. There are people who write that are so obsessive. You have uh, uh, people in the media that are so obsessive that they can only write about Trump and it's all negative. Uh, and Rutenberg puts a, uh, a fine uh, so way of saying it. But I mean, we could say the mainstream media has been anti-conservative, anti-Republican mm -hmm. forever and ever yeah. and ever, mm -hmm. but something new has happened. This time yeah. they feel justified. They well, they feel, feel justified and they're admitting what they're doing. You know, normally they would say, oh, I'm not biased. I wouldn't, I, I'm, I'm just looking at this and judging it to find out what's true, as Rutenberg says, and he's right. No, we're not doing that. We've decided this guy's bad, and we and, and we want to kill him. So it's gone from who us biased <laughs> to damn right we're biased. Yeah, yeah. Steve. Yeah, I mean, I, I probably agree with Rutenberg more than you might expect. I mean, I think that that what he yeah, what he for argues. An opinion magazine. <laughs> well, I do. No, that's that's the difference, yeah. actually. Yeah. I mean, I I think I don't think he's necessarily throwing over objectivity. He's saying. If it's objectively true that Trump is these things that I suggest he is, we ought to write about it and we ought to not be afraid to write about it. I get that. Where I think the media have fallen down is that they don't call out other candidates or public figures in the same way that they've called out Donald Trump. So the New York Times has made a big thing about calling out Donald Trump when he lies and right, using right. the word lie. Right. Fair enough. I, I think that's defensible. I think it's necessary. They have not done the same thing with Hillary Clinton. They have not done the same thing with Barack Obama. And I'll give you two examples. Hillary Clinton's 11 hours worth of testimony on Benghazi. She lied repeatedly throughout her testimony. Th you this wrote, is not, this piece, is not. You reported on that in a piece, <clears throat> the headline of which was, quote, absolute categorical lies, yeah. close quote. And, and, and I think it's important to call her out on that. I mean, she, she, th this is not, you know, gray area. Well, she might have been fudging. In one instance, she testified under oath that Sidney Blumenthal, from whom we have dozens and dozens of emails to Hillary Clinton from Hillary Clinton, giving her advice on Libya. He, she was being, he was being paid by the Clinton Foundation. She testified that he was not an advisor. There is literally not a better word in the English language under to oath. describe what Sidney Blumenthal was. And the New York Times did not call her out for lying. In fact, they wrote a piece the next day celebrating her performance. And then the one other example I'll give you real quickly sure, is, sure. is Barack Obama on Guantanamo. The president of the United States gave an interview to Yahoo News in December, talking about Cuba generally. He was asked about Guantanamo and he said, we always knew that there would be a handful of people who go back to the fight. Well, in fact, his director of national intelligence 
produced a report citing 196 people who have gone back to the fight. So it wasn't a We handful. know that 196 of the bad guys that we released from Guantanamo are now trying to kill us again. Correct. And the president said one handful. He also said that the people that he's released were, quote, low-level individuals. They're senior al-Qaeda, senior Taliban, bodyguards to Osama bin Laden. It's not true. It wasn't true. And nobody called out the president of the United States. Where was the New York Times writing front page above the fold stories about the president of the United States lying about something, about releasing terrorists back to the fight in the middle of uh, an ostensible war? Okay. Back to Trump. Let me give you a, just a little handful of quotations and then a couple of questions about those quotations. Jonathan Shade of New York, quote, New York Magazine, quote, Trump poses a mortal risk to the sanctity of American democracy and world peace, close quote. I'm not quite sure how you pose a risk to sanctity, but <coughs> still, you get the idea. The Atlantic Magazine, this is just a couple of days ago, the Atlantic Magazine has now endorsed a presidential candidate for only the second time in the long history. They endorsed Abraham Lincoln, they endorsed Lyndon Johnson, and now they have endorsed Hillary Clinton, writing of Trump that he is, quote, the most ostentatiously unqualified major party candidate in the 227 year history of the American presidency. Okay, so the first question is to the substance of those claims. Is Donald Trump a mortal threat to the republic? I certainly don't think so. Uh, he wouldn't be, I don't think he's somebody that I would choose uh, to be president, but you have two people running. And one of them's Donald Trump and the other one's Hillary Clinton. And uh, look, it's hard to write positive things about uh, Donald Trump the candidate or even Donald Trump the person. But he has one thing uh, that nobody else has. He is the one person who can keep Hillary Clinton from being president. You know, there's the Never Trump group and then there's the Never Hillary group. And if you're in the Never Hillary group, you have to be for Trump. Got it. Next question on, on the way the press is just, on the way the press and Steve Hayes have responded to Donald <laughs> Trump. If all this is true, that, that Trump is the madman, he's uniquely unqualified, he's something we've never seen before in American history, how can it be that the press so vividly sees this and something like 49, 48, whatever the polls are, percent of the American public doesn't? Something's not working. Either the press isn't working or, frankly, American democracy isn't working because the divide here between half of the country and most reporters has never been deeper. What's, what's, what's not working? Well, uh, the reporters are not working. That's what's new, really. I mean, Trump is a different kind of candidate. I, I uh, certainly agree about that. And look, I voted in the primaries. I didn't vote for him. Uh, the, he, he was my 17th choice, by the way, yeah. 17 GOP yeah, candidates. That's about right, okay. yes. <laughs> but, no, but nonetheless, he won. It's the press that has taken this completely different stand uh, that they've never done before. Now, there's always been a liberal bias, Peter. You know that. It's right. existed. And, but this is so far beyond that. This is picking winners. We, we've decided there's a presidential race. There are two people in it. And we're going to help this person win. That's Hillary Clinton. And, 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 one, and they do it two ways. They do it by writing stories and pieces on television attacking Trump day after day after day, many of them, and never mentioning, well, practically anything about Hillary Clinton except what she may say in a speech or some, or else, or else the, st the stories they run. I love some of these stories that the press falls for now, stories that Hillary Clinton has been told by her aides to expect a landslide. <laughs> or Hillary Clinton says, uh, Hillary's really not concerned about this campaign. She's concerned about her first year in office, and that's what she's concentrating on. The media falls for stuff like that, the, the, the crassest spin possible, and yet in this election, they run they it as if these it. are real stories. But I don't think you need to, I don't think, I mean, I think there's, there's truth to what Fred is saying, but I don't think that's, that's the problem here. I mean, you don't, you don't need the media to thumb the scales for Donald Trump. You just need to quote Donald Trump. I mean, ask him a question about ISIS. He has no idea what he's talking about. Like, zero. To, to, to call what Donald Trump, the answers Donald Trump gives in interviews and in debates gibberish is an insult to gibberish. It doesn't even rise to the level of gibberish. I mean, if I had them in front of me, I could, I could read from it. They're totally nonsensical. And <clears throat> I think, I think there's, there is certainly truth to the fact that the media are, are you know, for Hillary, for ideological reasons, for all sorts of reasons. But Donald Trump is a unique character, and I, I had an interesting conversation with Joe Tripp, who's a Democratic strategist who ran Howard Dean's cam campaign in 2004. And he think, thinks Trump is sort of the future of American politics because you can pick a couple of emotional issues 
And you don't have to win 49% of the American people in a Republican primary. You can win 10% or right. 20%, particularly right. in a divided field. Push those hot buttons, have name ID, ride to the Republican nomination, and then run, run in a general election. Okay, so <clears throat> one more question about Trump. Two views of Donald Trump. And, um, and actually, I've heard our friend Bill Kristol give voice to both views. Uh, <laughs> one view is that the candidacy of Donald Trump is a kind of one-off. It results from a long series of contingencies, happenstance, and so forth. Uh, he got a huge amount of free media because he was a television celebrity, in particular the New York media already, the New York Post and all those cable stations in New York already understood that he sold copies, so they moved fine. And then he, it would happen to be the case that there were too many other Republican candidates. They never coalesced. They, all of this is just, it's a one-off. But the other view is, not really. Donald Trump, for all his inadequacies, saw something or intuited something real in the American body politic. And I don't know, this sounds as though... I'm giving him credit, and maybe there's no other way to say it than to give him credit. He did what a leader does. He saw something that everyone else was missing. Which view? Uh, both are true, yeah. actually, uh, I, I think. Donald Trump did see something. You know, he, he read, one of the things he read before running was this book, Blue Collar Conservative, uh, <clears throat> and, uh, and realized there was a constituency out there that was underserved. It was this uh, lower middle class constituency that once been uh, democratic and now had split with them. They were unhappy. They were in all these uh, worn out old industrial towns across the Rust Belt and so on. And there are millions and millions of them. And Trump recognized them as a constituency. And you see, and, and so what were the two issues that he is most associated with and talked about the most? Immigration. And of course, these people think uh, illegal immigrants and, and legal immigrants have, have stolen jobs from them and trade, which has sent jobs overseas that the trade deals that America's made. So he saw something there and he has capitalized on it. Yeah, I agree. Go, I would agree with Fred. <clears throat> no, I think it's exactly right. And I think the way that he, he manipulated the media, particularly in the Republican primary, was masterful. I mean, the things that he did to, to get so media he's not attention. Stupid. We're not we're dealing this is an intelligent man. You have to grant that, Steve, well, right? I think he's He's clever sometimes. He's not well informed. I mean, particularly on the on the issues. But he, yeah, I think he has in sort of an instinct for getting attention for himself. So if that is the same thing as being smart, you then want to fair say enough. that the brain stem is active. The, yeah, the, the, I, look, the, the frontal <laughs> cortex is not well developed. Is that? Okay. Those are your words. But, right. I mean, he, if you look at what he did with with the media, and this is, I think, you know, at a time when you have seven and ten Americans who want to change the direction of the country. He basically came in and said, I'm not going to do anything the way that it's been done before. I mean, I'm sick of these people just the way that you all are sick of these people. I'm going to change the rules. And he did it in politics by bringing up issues that were mm -hmm. thought to have been taboo. I mean, Republicans in Washington didn't want to talk about immigration. Trump That's brought up right. immigration and, mm -hmm. and, and made the case. Yeah. Uh, you look at what he did with the media. I mean, think about what he did with the media. This is a guy who's, whose office is three, four blocks from CBS News and NBC and Fox News. And he said, no, I'm not going to come in for an interview. I'm going to call yeah. you from my house. And if you want an interview with me, come over to Trump Tower. So viewers in their living rooms who were watching Trump saw him with you know, the gilded escalator in the background. Yeah, the, and, the waterfall and he was playing the lobby, on he right. was playing on his on his home turf. And right. you know, you can overdo that, but I think it said to, to, to viewers, I'm not playing their game. This is how they've done this before. Right. And he, he, he played his own game. He has been more available <clears throat> to the media than any presidential candidate ever. And, uh, and whether they come by uh, to see him in the Trump Tower, and they do take, uh, I mean, to call in the, the Sunday morning shows, which think of themselves as, oh, you know, we're so important, and they let Trump call in, yeah. was, I'm still amazed by it, yeah. but they wanted him, okay. and so yep. they agreed to that. Back to the campaign in a moment. We don't know who's going to win, only a few weeks until we find out, but we do know that in January, Barack Obama will be leaving the White House very briefly. Mm -hmm. The legacy of Barack Obama, foreign affairs. Is the country safer today than it was before he became president? Steve? No, it's a disaster. I mean, I think his foreign policy has been an absolute catastrophe from front to back. If you look at the things that he said he was going to do at the beginning of the administration, he's set out to, to do them, and, and I don't think there's any question that he's left us unsafe. He himself, in an interview with NPR, admitted that his Iran deal, the signature foreign policy achievement, would lead to an Iranian nuclear 
an Iranian nuke in 10 years. They had a glide path to the bomb. He later corrected himself after he, had, he made that admission. And what That's, was the correction? Because the admission was the truth, wasn't it? The admission it? was the truth. And, and he said, no, no, I didn't mean it exactly how I said it. That gives us 10 years and, to change their minds, right, that sort of right, thing. Right, we're going right. to work with them. But if you look at what he's done on you know, the, the war on terror or the non-war on terror as, as he's prosecuted it, he seems to be of the view that if we're simply nicer to our enemies. Yeah, but what about all those people we're killing with drones? He's popped a lot more bad guys and, frankly, innocent bystanders than George W. Bush ever dreamed of hitting. He wanted a clean war on terror. So he didn't want to have to, he didn't want to capture them because he didn't want to have to interrogate them. He didn't want to interrogate them because I think in some respects he didn't want to know what they were doing. And if you look at what he's done with Guantanamo, at the way that he has basically taken his hands off mm -hmm. on Al Qaeda more generally, the way that he sold himself as having solved, remember, Going into the 2012 presidential election, in May of 2012, the president said, Al-Qaeda, we are close to strategic mm -hmm. defeat of Al-Qaeda. I mean, Al-Qaeda is st stronger now than it ever has been. ISIS is growing and has presence in countries that we never thought it would. So he's as much of a fantasist in his mm -hmm. own way as Donald Trump. I think that's an apt comparison. Mm -hmm. Fred? Steve is great on this stuff, no question about it. I agree with everything he said, and okay. he said it better than I could. But look, you look around the world, America is, has been in retreat in its influence, its ability to, check, uh, to project power, uh, to, have a, uh, to be a force for good in the world. We've retreated on all those things under Obama, and it continues. And then there's secondly, so, and, ahead, and then there's secondly uh, the economy. Uh, I don't think Obama is an economic illiterate, and yet he's acted like one. Why do we have this 1% to 2% growth uh, uh, for eight years now? It, it, it doesn't have to be that way. O Obamacare, fair summary it, statement. This, it's this, it's this, in collapse. It's in collapse. It is in collapse. There really is no other way to put it. Yeah. Premiums are and that's going not up. Conservatives. That's not conservatives who are saying this. I mean, I yeah. was driving out of Washington the other day listening to NPR doing a series of interviews See, that confirms with my people suspicions of you that, that you I actually do listen to NPR. I love NPR. I mean, you have to know where they're coming from, but I love NPR. I never I'm, listen a, to I'm NPR. addicted. I'm addicted. <laughs> okay. But they did a, a series of stories interviewing people who were su the supposed beneficiaries of Obamacare. This was who the law was supposed to help finding themselves with higher premiums, higher deductibles, losing insurance plans, losing doctors. I mean, Everybody recognizes. I mean, if mm -hmm. you take a step back and look, you want to look at the, the, the Obama legacy in totality, think of the three biggest things the president did, right? Obamacare. He came in, Obamacare would be one, the stimulus would be another, economic recovery, and the Iran deal. What evidence is there that, that any of those have worked? Obamacare is in near total collapse. The Iran deal is, has, uh, we've, we have re-allied ourselves with Iran in a way that's remaking the Middle East in, I think, a, a potentially disastrous way. And the economy, the Wall Street Journal had a, a headline just the other day, U.S. in slowest recovery since 1949, seven and a half years in. How can you look at this presidency and say that it's been anything but a failure? Let me take you to one other component that's in the news a lot and has been in the, uh, since the summer, race. And let me quote your Weekly Standard colleague, Chris Caldwell. Quote, for most whites, Obama has not been a confidence builder. Obama's election was seen by many as the final act of the civil rights movement that it should instead institutionalize and even bring a new elan to government programs that most citizens had thought temporary, that is affirmative action, various forms of redistribution to various ethnic groups and so forth, was a shock. Any system of race-based transfers and rights will eventually polarize voters along racial lines, close quote. Barack Obama, a uniter and a healer. Fred? Yeah, he's certainly not either of those. And remember what he said when he ran in uh, 2008. It wasn't that he was the more liberal candidate. Uh, it wasn't that he had more experience. That he was the candidate who uniquely knew how to end this era of polarization. That he would come to Washington and he would be with, uh, bring in Republicans and he would talk to them and he would be bipartisan. Post-partisan, post-racial. And he would change Washington, right. yeah. And, and it was certainly post-partisan and post-racial. And now we know, of course, as Chris Caldwell writes, that things like affirmative action, they are just like any other government program. Once you institute it, it's there forever. Right. So, I'll, I want to get back to Trump and, and uh, Clinton, but let me try this trick on you. Claire Booth Luce, whom Fred will remember, she spent her last few years in Washington during yes. the Reagan years. Claire Booth Luce used to say that no matter how great the figure, history will give him only one sentence. Lincoln freed the slaves, 
Churchill saved Britain. Mm -hmm. One sentence for Barack Obama. Fred? Boy, I hadn't thought about that, but I will. Uh, uh, <clears throat> Barack Obama presided over America's retreat. Yeah, Steve? I, I don't know that I can improve on that because it's, it covers both the domestic side and the foreign side. The president of retreat. All right. Uh, I stipulate for our viewers that we are recording this show before the second <clears throat> debate and professionals that you are, that you'll be very squeamish about making predictions. Actually, you're not squeamish about them at all because at all. all those years of John McLaughlin saying, prediction! <laughs> Freddie the Beetle Bonds? Uh, okay, so... No, I don't mind predictions. I just mind accountability. <laughs> That's what I don't like. Okay, so let's get to the predictions in a moment. First, just a little more about what's going on in the campaign. Uh, analyst more or less on our side, uh, Walter Olson, has said that this is our first European election. This is the first election in American history in which class divide is the dominant dynamic. And in our case, the American case, the class divide falls along the line of those who've been to college and can't stand Donald Trump, it turns out, and may not be enthused about Hillary Clinton, but are gonna go for her, and those who have not been to college, and their Donald Trump is dom particularly among males. We are, we are moving into European territory. Steve? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a fair way to characterize the election in, in sort of a, a, a broad sense, um, and the, pol the polling bears that out. Um, Ron Brownstein uh, has been particularly good on this. Ron Brownstein's where? LA Times these uh, days? No, the Atlantic. The Atlantic, the oh, Atlantic okay. now, right. um, has been particularly good on, on cataloging this as the campaign has gone on. I would suggest that there's, and your mention of Walter Olson is what triggered this for me, that, that there's another sort of interesting aspect, to, an under-discussed aspect to this election, and that is the, the, the missed opportunity by libertarians. Walter Olson's a, a libertarian. Mm -hmm. I mean, if ever there were an election where libertarians should have had an opportunity to make inroads uh, with mm -hmm. the American electorate vis-a-vis uh, -vis the two major parties, this would have been it. Faith in government is at an all-time low today, lower than it was in the post-Watergate days, right. even. Mm -hmm. and. You have two major party candidates who, in the Fox News poll that was taken two weeks ago, viewers were given two options, terrible or not terrible. Nearly half of the American electorate decided that these two choices were terrible. Mm -hmm. If ever there were a time for libertarians to, to mount a case, this would have been it. Uh, and they didn't. They failed. They nominated Gary Johnson, who has, uh, for, you know, in a series of missteps, I guess you'd call them, Shown that he's not a credible alternative. So, he, the, but the liberty, the, he's at eight percent in the late, latest poll. So, this right. upper half of single digits. But that's hurting. Is that disproportionately coming from Trump? No, it's not at it's all. Not. It's not. It's no. actually coming a little bit more from Hillary yeah. than from Trump. Oh, I see. Oddly enough, uh, and uh, it's because it, he is not a pure libertarian. I think. And you know, I once I went to a dinner party with Gary Johnson, and it turns out he's interested in one issue. Marijuana. Yeah, drug legalization. Right. That's it. Uh, that's, I mean, libertarians. That's, that's Hillary's to, crowd. Okay. They have to get beyond that. <laughs> well, he's, 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 do well. He's, done, he's doing exceedingly well with, with millennials. Um, Hillary Clinton was, was destroyed by Bernie Sanders in the competition for millennials during the Democratic primary. They don't like her. And they're looking for alternatives, and they've sort of settled for now on mm -hmm. Gary Johnson. And I mm -hmm. think that's why he's pulling more from her. Yeah, there's from, one other from divide yeah. yep. in the country. And you look at it this way. Donald Trump will probably win all the states uh, that Mitt Romney won in 2012. What does that tell you? There is still a very sharp partisan divide in the country that's there. There's also the one, of course, with Re the regions. The regional divide still yeah. matters. Well, it's yeah. Republicans yeah. still have the mountains in the central and the Midwest. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, Joe, and the Midwest, and of, and of course all of the South, with the right. exception of Florida, right. and, uh, and 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 they and and that hasn't changed even with Trump being such a different candidate, particularly from Mitt Romney. Okay, let me try Chris Caldwell once again. Over the past generation, Democrats have become the party of the new economy ruling class. Bear that thought in mind. The party of the new economy ruling class. This might break up the old electoral map in odd ways. If Trump does poorly, he could lose old Republican states that are becoming too rich to vote Republican, Virginia, for example. If Trump does well, he could take industrial states with downwardly mobile white populations that used to vote Democratic, Michigan, Ohio, Pennsylvania. Ruling class versus ordinary folks 
and that may cut a few states in unusual ways. Does that sound right? Yeah, no, be, not, uh, not true. Look, I live in Virginia, yep. and, and Virginia's uh, changed for, for different reasons. Obama won it twice. Why has Virginia changed so much? You know, 50 years ago, m most people in Virginia, 90% of them, were actually born in Virginia, right. and they were uh, conservative folk. Now, a majority of the people in, in, and voters in Virginia were not born in Virginia. Many were born overseas. Uh, there are many immigrants there of a, of a pretty high educated class. Uh, it, it's a, uh, demographically, it's a completely different state. Um, it's not that, uh, that the same people have decided that they reject uh, oh, the see. Republican okay. Party. Okay. Uh, so what are the states to watch? Give us, give us, give us a kind of election. Give, uh, we're in the <clears> final <throat> phase now I of think, this campaign. Mm -hmm. People like us are looking at the polls every single day. It's 50 state elections, not one national election. Nobody can can't follow 50. So give us the states you've got. What, what states are you going to be watching between now and the election? Florida. That's it. Well, not entirely, but Florida, I think, is the main one. Trump is Trump, uh, Scott, uh, Ohio. Trump looks good in Ohio. Really? Uh, Pennsylvania is a lot like Ohio, demographically. Uh, and uh, it's going to be hard for Trump to win it. You remember George W. Bush couldn't win it, and right. either when he ran for uh, election and then for re-election after trying very hard, but Florida is, has turned out to be a much tougher state for Trump than I thought. And Trump can win the election if he wins all the Romney states, Ohio, Pennsylvania, and Florida. And I think Florida has become the hardest one. Florida is harder Florida. than Pennsylvania? Yeah, it just turns out that way. For uh, Particularly, Florida has an awful lot more Hispanics uh, than Pennsylvania has. Uh, and it's, it's, uh, uh, the polling shows it's a, a difficult state By for... The way, could, I, could I ask a slightly mm -hmm. subversive question? <laughs> Around here, people have, I am aware, there's been some money going to Senator Rob Portman of Ohio mm -hmm. because he's the kind of Republican who's acceptable. So we're, we have all kinds of questions about whether we ought to give money mm -hmm. to Donald Trump, and mostly the answer is no, but we can give money with a clear conscience to Senator Portman. Mm -hmm. And now Senator Portman has put together such a, an astonishingly good campaign mm -hmm. with the demographics and the the uh, high-tech stuff about district by district, door to door, that he could get Donald Trump elected. Uh, well, I don't know whether what do you he get Donald Trump elected. It, I it, he could, he I could help he'll, help him, he'll help him in Ohio. In a significant yeah. way, because oh, Trump, course, hasn't, yeah. Trump mm -hmm. hasn't taken seriously mm -hmm. get-out-the-vote operations, mm -hmm. data operations, to the extent that he's doing it at all. He's poaching from the RNC, their pre-existing uh, operations. There was a story today that he's now uh, out in trying to hire uh, field organizations in swing states. I mean, this is this is a, a month before the election, and he's trying to outsource his get out the vote operation. But he said publicly too. I mean, remember, he said publicly and repeatedly, despite having been told by Karl Rove and others that you need to have this if you're yeah. going to win. Mm -hmm. He said publicly, I'm not just not interested in that. Not I'm going mm -hmm. to give speeches. I'm going to go on way. Twitter. You know. So aside from Rob Portman, what senators, what Republican senators up for re-election are doing an unusually good job? Who's safe? What The, the whole question mm -hmm. of the Senate. Uh, well, Marco Rubio in Florida. He's running so far ahead. He's running uh, half a dozen uh, percentage points ahead of his Democratic uh, opponent for the Senate. Uh, and... And Trump is running a half a dozen percentage points behind Hillary yeah. in Florida. Uh, so Marco Rubio is doing uh, very well. Of course, he's an incumbent running for re-election now that he gave up on his, his, uh, his presidential campaign. So what's the, that failed. what's the likelihood that if Hillary wins by a couple of points, well, we'll come to that. <clears throat> I think the general feeling is that the election is likely to be fairly close. And if it's a Hillary victory, what's the likelihood that well, GOP holds look, the Well, it really Senate? depends. I mean, somebody yep. like Paul Ryan, the House Speaker, says... It makes a big difference whether Hillary wins by four points or seven points. Right, now he right. hasn't given up on the election, but it does. Uh, and if it's if uh, if it's a say a two point race, Republicans still then have a a, a good chance of holding on to the Senate. If it's a five or six point race, of Hillary winning, they'll lose the Senate probably. So it really it really does make a difference whether it's close or not. It's been interesting. I mean, I, just to ask you a question. I mean, if if I would have said to you a year ago that Hillary Clinton could win by four points and Republicans could hold the Senate, mm -hmm. you would have thought that was crazy. Mm -hmm. I would have thought that was crazy. Yeah. Right. I mean, right. I assumed for for months that whoever won the White House was yep. more likely to win the the Senate than not. Mm -hmm. And if current polling is to be believed, Republicans have maybe a slight edge in keeping 
the Senate, mm -hmm. um, or 50 50. Which really 51. would be your ideal outcome, wouldn't it, Steve, for the country? Well, look, I mean, Hillary, I'm, Hillary I'm not, Clinton hemmed in by a Republican I'm not, House and I'm, Senate. I'm not at all. I, I mean, I, it, it, the idea of four years of a Hillary Clinton as president I, gives me shivers. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I can't okay, imagine a, Hillary close Clinton your eyes, as boys. president. Close your eyes. It's now November 9th. Open your eyes. Mm -hmm. Hillary Clinton won, but the Republicans squeaked out the Senate. It's 51 49. Mm -hmm. They still retain. Mitch McConnell is still Senate Majority Leader. Mm -hmm. What happens in the country in the first 100 days under President Hillary Clinton? A total impasse. I mean, Hillary Clinton, I think, would be inclined to try to make some deals with Republicans, Paul Ryan in particular. And what would happen if she did? The left wing, the dominant yeah. wing, the energetic wing of the Democratic the Party Bernie Sanders would go, wing. Would go, the Bernie Sanders wing, they would go berserk. It would make her uh, a president who couldn't govern. I think yeah. that may be the case anyway, but, uh, but I think she's extremely hemmed in, uh, except on one thing that matters to a lot of people, and that's uh, uh, filling uh, seats on the Supreme Court. So, okay, so let's take it the other way. Hillary Clinton, it's now November 9th, Hillary Clinton has been elected president, and the Democrats just took the Senate. Now it's 52-48, those close Indiana, Pennsylvania, New Hampshire, all broke for the Democrats in the Senate. Hillary Clinton is president. Democrats have the Senate. And the only way she can move is to the left. Is that correct? Well, she's sort of, uh, I don't know whether she'll have to move any more to the left than she did during the campaign, it, but she's a prisoner of the left. They're the dominant wing of the party, so, and they are relentless, and they are watching everything she does. What I'm getting at is mm -hmm. that Hillary Clinton, mm -hmm. if she wins, under, mm -hmm. under there's almost no scenario that's at all likely under mm -hmm. which she wins under which she can claw her way back to the centrist position mm -hmm. of her husband mm -hmm. those years ago. That's not possible. I think it's not possible. And I, I'm not as sanguine about Fred that she would even try. I mean, Hillary Clinton is fundamentally a, a political person. I mean, she, that, that's what she does. It's what drives her. her. It politics. drives her. And she knows, she, she appreciates the reality that the center of gravity in the Democratic Party has moved far, far left. I think she would try to do what President Obama's done since Republicans took the Senate in 2014, which is govern, govern to the govern left, without them. push as hard, complain about Republicans at, at every stage, and hope that that's enough to, to help her win, to, to buck historical trends and win seats okay. in the first midterm. Steve, this next question is going to be hard for you. I know that. <laughs> They've and all I been hard you to for know, me. I want you to know, I feel your, now you close your eyes, we'll open them, it's November 9th, Donald Trump has won. Donald Trump has won, and Republicans now have 52, 53 seats in the Senate. The first 100 days, what happens? I don't think Donald Trump knows the answer to that question. Um, we've heard, I think, credible stories that Donald Trump ha has said he's sort of willing to outsource policy. Uh, we heard that in connection with his efforts to get John Kasich to join he has his, to outsource his ticket. outsource because he knows no he's policy. Not, he, that... he told the same thing to Paul Ryan. There are stories that he's said roughly the same thing to Mike Pence. Mm -hmm. If you want to create a best case scenario, that's it. That Donald Trump says, I'm, my job as president is to make America great again, which means, you know, tweeting, giving some speeches, golfing. rallying mm -hmm. people, golfing. Mm -hmm. And here, Mike Pence and Paul Ryan, you guys run the show. I guess that I'm not. That would be wonderful. Well, it would. I don't think mm -hmm. that's likely to happen. Mm -hmm. I don't think that there's any reason to believe that Paul Ryan and Mike Pence would win internal White House arguments over Jeff Sessions and Stephen Miller and some of these other guys. And I think you'd, you'd see a very divided Republican Party. Fred will now tell you why we should be well, happy we, instead we, of we, filled with foreboding. There will be a divided Republican Party either way. It, the party's just divided. Right. And uh, it, it, how, how uh, much Trump would want to be his own man in the White House, I don't know. But presidents usually do. They don't. I just happened to read a book about John F. Kennedy, supposedly a, the tool of his advisors and, and his tax cuts. And it, you read it and you realize that Kennedy had all these advisors, but he didn't give a darn for their advice. Mm -hmm. He did what he uh, wanted to do. That's right. what presidents do. And uh, I think Trump will do uh, a lot of things that he wants to do that we, don't, we may not even know about that. I know he wants to build a wall and he wants to renegotiate, renegotiate trade treaties and so on. Other things, I'm not so sure. But uh, I, look, he'll listen to his aides, but you know, Trump will be making the decisions. The okay. presidents do. So, uh, last couple of questions here. On the, in the Democratic Party, the oldest and one of the greatest political parties on the planet, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, 
John Fitzgerald Kennedy. John Fitzgerald Kennedy, who ran to the right of Richard Nixon on national defense and who instituted sharp income tax cuts, from John Fitzgerald Kennedy to Hillary Clinton. How did that happen? <laughs> America became polarized and the uh, ideological wings of both parties, but particularly the Democratic Party in recent years, uh, uh, took over the parties. They're running them. I mean, the, the Republicans are a conservative party and the Democrats are, are a liberal party. Uh, and, and, and remember, it didn't used to be that way. Remember all the, we, there used to be a lot of liberal Republicans, Peter. There used to be a lot more right. moderate Republicans. There used to be a lot of conservative Democrats. There are no conservative Democrats in Washington now, that's for sure. So here's what your colleague and our friend Andy Ferguson has written just the other evening. He's writing about Graydon Carter, editor of Vanity Fair, attacking Donald Trump. I'm quoting Andy now. This is a longish one, but Andy's prose is worth it, as you know. This is Andy now. He, Graydon Carter, calls the Trump ascendancy the final stage of a dumbed-down America. Who could disagree? Trump's rise, boosted by the 40% of our fellow citizens who see him as a plausible president, is indeed evidence of a serious system-wide failure. Dumbing down is a good name for it. The question is, who did the dumbing down? Our public schools, our universities, our entertainment media, television, movies, popular music, the press, glossy magazines like Vanity Fair. Surely all of them share the blame and all of them from the schools to the movie studios rest in the control of liberal Democrats and have done so for 50 years or more. If we're getting dumber, we know whom to thank. How odd is their sniffy contempt for Donald Trump, the purest flowering of the culture they've created. You buy every word of that? Every word, and it is a penetrating insight that I don't think anybody else has made it no. quite so succinctly and powerfully as Andy has. Okay, so here's the last, I'm not sure how to articulate, yes, I know, how to, I know what I want to ask. Here's my last question, fellas. Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump, in our, Fred and I are older than you are, Steve, but in our lifetimes, there have not been two candidates so repellent. I, is that fair? I think they're both repellent people. And we've just agreed that, the, that there has been a dumbing down of America. Have we reached, is America in decline? Fred and I are old enough to remember mm -hmm. the 70s when everybody mm -hmm. said, that's it, mm -hmm. we're in decline, it's like the end of Rome, and then along came Ronald Reagan and there was a renaissance, there was mm -hmm. a recovery, and the country won the great conflict that it, in which it found itself locked, the Cold War. Well, is there a possibility of such a recovery again, or has something happened about the dumbing down of the culture, has something irreparable taken place? Steve. Well, I, uh, let me answer the question two different ways. If you ask me to give uh, simply a descriptive answer and a, a cold, hard assessment, I think there's no question that America's in decline for the reasons you suggest, for other reasons, the dependency on government, the entitlement state. I mean, the fact that we're not dealing with entitlements, we're passing on these, this debt to, to our kids. Um, so I think on a, just a purely descriptive basis, that would be accurate. I can't, however, afford to look at it that way. I have three little kids and a fourth on the way. Congratulations. You, you, can't, you can't say, you, you can't, I think, be willing to say, nah, the, the American experiment is coming to a close. And it was great while it lasted. And you can't do that. So you've got to keep fighting to, to restore it, even if it seems like a hopeless fight. The father of nine grandchildren? The, the, uh, look, the, uh, the whole Trump campaign is based on the idea that America is in decline. That's why he wants to make America great again, that we're not great now. We've, we've changed. And, uh, you know, that slogan has really helped him a lot. Uh, the problem is it is uh, very hard to change government uh, and its direction. And there's only one person who's really done it in, the la in my lifetime, really, and that's Ronald Reagan. Now... We and even, even that achievement proved temporary. It, it, it did, but it was important. It, right. I mean, there were some things that Reagan did, uh, as you would know, Peter, that were not temporary. He won the Cold War or, right. or was the leading figure in winning the Cold War. And he turned the economy around for a while and so on. Uh, now, here, what's interesting is when Ronald Reagan became president, and I voted for him, and I liked him, but I didn't realize he was going to be a president with this great vision and this power uh, that he turned out to have. Now, maybe there is somebody out there uh, who can 
to be elected president and, and, and do the kind of transformation that Ronald Reagan did. I don't think it's Hillary Clinton or Donald Trump, however, but, but, but there may be somebody else out there. Are you optimistic about the America in which your nine grandchildren will find themselves adults? Well, not in the short run, but America has been very, very resilient in the past. And, uh, they, but there are some things that are hard to turn around. And one is the role of government in American life that is, is growing all the time. And it's unfortunate and it's, uh, it's hard to stop. Okay. I said that was the last question, but just for the sheer perverse pleasure of it, <laughs> let me do that Claire Booth loose thing again, where history gives even the greatest figure only one sentence. What one sentence will history give to Donald Trump? Steve. He was a very successful con man in business and in politics. <sighs> Remind me never to cross you, Fred. It depends on whether he wins or not. <laughs> if he wins, he'll say, I made America great again. <laughs> if he loses, he'll say, the election was stolen. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Fred Barnes, Steve Hayes, both of the Weekly Standard and Fox News, thank you. Thank you. Peter. For Uncommon Knowledge on the Hoover Institution, I'm Peter Robinson. Thank you.